available for you as well. So without further ado, Barb, if you want to get us started and then hopefully we'll go from there. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for inviting me here today. Patricia asked me to come here today to show you some of my libguides that I've created for our community. All of these libguides are publicly available for anyone to use, not just FIU users. So they are available to anyone in the world right now. I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen. Sorry, stop sharing my video and start sharing my screen so that you can see these libguides. So one moment while I switch over. Oh, host disabled screen sharing. You right, have to make you. her a moderator. Yeah. It's working now. So you should see my Firefox, which is open to the PubMed guide. Mm -hmm. Okay. The PubMed guide is currently one of our most used libguides at FIU. PubMed, as you know, is the number one biomedical database, and it is free to everyone. So this is a libguide that not only the libguide is free, but mm -hmm. also the resource is covering is free. PubMed changed from the classic old platform to the new platform this summer. So this libguide is currently being updated to reflect the newest interface, but the tutorials and links right now are all working effectively. So one of the features that this libguide has is that it has a PubMed search box embedded right within the homepage. So users can use the tutorials or also just search PubMed immediately. I'll go ahead and do a quick search here for say cancer. And as you can see, it takes them straight directly to the new PubMed search results page. Now within this libguide, there's also pages for new and advanced users, tutorial, a comparison of PubMed and Medline, which is a subscription version, Refrex, and that's been expanded to include Mendeley, Zotero, and EndNote since FIU has recently added more citation managers to our offerings. And it has a PubMed and Espanol page, which is one of our most used pages. And I'd like to thank Beatriz Fernandez B for helping me translate this page. And also Patricia for looking over the translations as well. So this is basically a clone of the English page, but the resources here are all available fully in Spanish. So for example, it has pages to external sites covering mesh in Espanol, how to use the filter, and again, that's being updated to reflect the new interface, and so on and so forth. Now, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through every page, but I did want to show this database guide. And because it was so popular, the same was done for the CINAHL and Embase database guides as well. So they now also have Embase in Espanol, CINAHL and Espanol options. The difference is that PubMed is a free database available to everyone, CINAHL and Embase are not. These resources are limited to FIU users or to affiliates of other institutions that subscribe to them. However, the tutorials, every tutorial on these pages, every external link is free. So even though they may not have access to CINAHL off campus, when the libraries are open normally, guests can come to FIU libraries to use these resources on our computers, regardless of whether the community members are FIU members. And of course, the tutorials are available for them 24 seven, basically. So guests can essentially learn how to use the databases with these free resources then come use them on site. Now I have here a few more options of our libguides. One of them is one of our newest resources, obviously the COVID-19 coronavirus information guide. This is a guide that's being updated on an almost daily basis. I began it, I remember on March 2nd, when the first cases were confirmed in Florida. As soon as those two cases were confirmed in the Tampa Bay area, I created the libguide because it became evident that this would be a need in our community in the very near future. And this is essentially a compilation of resources with a focus on the South Florida area. So for example, it has a link to the Florida Department of Health dashboard with statistics that's updated on a daily basis. It has the moving to a new normal page for Miami-Dade County. It has USF's website and also the Miami Herald COVID-19 tracker. And in addition to those local resources, there's a worldwide data, CDC updates, and more. So the idea here is to create up-to-date, reliable information that if someone bookmarks this page, they can get immediate, accurate, reliable information updated on an almost daily basis. And this is resources that I find and review and also that my colleagues have been wonderful in sending to me. So for example, the Dean of Libraries early this week sent me this page for the medical letter, which is a very comprehensive PDF looking at all the different treatments that have been considered for COVID-19 over the last few months. So these links are being replaced continually as new information arises. And again, everything here is free to everyone. It includes information for healthcare professionals, it includes information for the public, it includes, for example, the address of clinics available in the area or telehealth information from Baptist Health. Everything here is geared toward the South Florida community, both the public and researchers. There's also some specialized pages here. So for example, it links out to CDC, Florida Department of Health, who and more. 
as well as the Miami Herald, and including some vendor portals. A lot of vendors, as you know, have made their resources free of charge regarding COVID. So EBSCO, Elsevier, Emerald, and more, they have many, though not all, databases and resources that are free regarding this because of the urgent nature of it. And this last page here for academics and researchers, this is more specialized. Some of these are by now, even though it's been less than six months, historical documents. So for example, one of the first links added was colleges and university closures. Now, obviously everything is pretty much closed by now, but that was not the case early on. So I've left some of these here so that you can see how quickly everything progressed in terms of researchers may want to use that information to see how basically the dominoes fall one by one over the course of March. And then it has information here on decontamination of library materials. It's a fascinating system I give you that recently came out, as well as some scholarly research databases. So Oxford has an excellent evidence service that's free to everyone. There's the United Nations Eye Library, of course, the WHO database of publications on COVID. All of these are free. In fact, the only one here that's not free to everyone is the ProQuest aggregator. That's the only one that's limited to FAU affiliates. So that's something that's great that's come out of this that many vendors have made their research resources free of charge regarding the coronavirus. And the last two lib guides I'll show and then I'll take questions. I'll be happy to take questions are two that were created in response to student demand, but they've also happened to gather a lot of traffic from Google. So they've become two of our most used library guides at FIU. One is the research methods help guide and the other is how to find and conduct systematic reviews. Mm -hmm. And both of these I created for the same reason. I would help students find articles and then that initial research interview would turn into a second reference interview basically. So for example, the initial question would be how do I find the peer reviewed article on say diabetes? And the question would evolve into how do I know if it's quantitative or qualitative data? How do I know if it's a randomized control trial versus a cohort study? So both of these guides were created for that purpose, to address these common student questions. And the research methods help guide, for example, includes a quick glossary of terms that students who are new to research may not be too familiar with, such as independent variable, dependent variable. It includes types of studies, types of research and data, and so on and so forth. And for example, if a student is tasked with finding a case control study, it'll define what that means and then it'll tell them if they hover over the link how to find that particular type of study in the databases. So for example, in CINAHL, they would have to use the heading case control studies. In Medline, they would use this particular mesh term to identify that type of study. And again, even though some of these resources, as you see, have a lock, meaning they're limited to FIU users, they can be used on site when the libraries are open, but the information here is available to everyone. So all these definitions, all these instructions are available free to anyone in the world, essentially. And of course, it has external links to websites. For example, Himmelfarb is excellent, and it links externally to their website as well. It also had some additional resources, such as books and some videos available at the libraries, as well as for a particular community, offices on campus that can provide additional help with research methods. And in that vein, there's the systematic review libguide. So again, it's focused specifically on the systematic review study type, which is essentially looking at basically all the evidence that has been published on a particular research question. So for example, is zinc an effective treatment for the common colds? The researcher would look at all the studies on this topic published in PubMed, CINAHL, Embase, and other databases to answer that question comprehensively. This arose out of a course that was created for social work. Public health had a similar course at FIU, and basically the students had to devise their own systematic review over the course of a semester. So this guide will basically provide a compilation of resources that can be used for systematic reviews. And some of these are subscription. So for example, if I subscribe to Covidence, but there is a free trial available. And some of these like the Stella Rasa and Ryan, they're available to everyone, they're free tools. So this includes a mix of both subscription and free resources. And I'll say whether they're free of charge or require a subscription. Find systematic reviews, again, a mix of free and subscription resources available. Some are specialized, others are general. And then the most comprehensive part of this guide is, again, it's meant to be non-friendly for students. So it does have some kindergarten caliber clip art here, but basically it walks students through the process of conducting their own systematic review. Everything from choosing the topic to identifying keywords to, for example, choosing databases or choosing subjects in terms of explosion. 
this is one of our, as I mentioned, most frequently used libguides, not just by RFI users, but basically by Google users. And I've been told that it's basically one of the simplest guides to conducting a systematic review available because, again, it was created for students, not for researchers. So it's not as comprehensive, obviously, as something that, say, Cochrane would provide to professional researchers, but it is meant to be an introductory resource to providing your first systematic review. And again, it's free for everyone. And it includes other systematic review sources, many of which are free, such as massive open online courses, such as Coursera's course on systematic reviews provided by Johns Hopkins and more. And those are basically a quick introduction to our most frequently used libguides at FIU, the various types. There's the students geared or instructional libguides, the quickly updated on a day-to-day -day basis libguide, which is the COVID one most prominently at these days, as well as the database guides available in both English and Spanish. So thank you very much and I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you so much. I just want you guys to know too, as uh, Barbara went through, I was making sure to paste those URLs to the LibGuide she was discussing in the chat. So if you have a chance, you can go in and take a look at those and feel free to, to review them. I love that you had a wide array of both uh, student you know, login FIU proprietary own subscriptions, but also a lot that were open to anybody, which is super, super helpful, especially in a group like this. Oh, I won't know by the way. I'm sorry. So I was going to add that these are basically reusable. So you can copy the LibGuide contents or particular boxes or pages to your own LibGuides. And I do include reuse information on all the guides. So it's basically a Creative Commons license. Anyone in the world can copy that content over to your own LibGuides with just a quick attribution box. You want to share some of the numbers on those? How many times they've been used? Uh, sure. So I can go ahead and share my screen again. I'll pull up my profile page, which has a chronological for the year indication of how many times they've been used. So the PubMed LibGuide alone has been used over 1 million times by now. Wow. And that's mainly from users in Spanish speaking countries. So clearly there was a need for a PubMed tutorial in for Spanish speakers. And here we can see, for example, PubMed this year has almost 75,000 And base guide and SIN are both in the low thousands. The how to find and conduct systematic reviews that's guarded about 5,000. And then most of those would be external users, not just FIU affiliates. The COVID 19 was about 3,000 so far this year. And over the various years that I've been at FIU, they've been used by 91 countries according to our Google Analytics, and they have garnered over 1 million views total. That is impressive. Mm -hmm. oh. That's really amazing. Thank you. It's Google picked it up. It somehow became the number two results above actual Medline and PubMed itself, the PubMed oh, guy wow. <laughs> at one point. <laughs> wow. So I we wanted to to really bring this up and talk about how, you know, libraries, whether it be academic and public, can really work with the community and and our partnership when, when it comes to health. And I think that it takes different forms, both with academic libraries and public libraries. And we were looking at some very basic statistics to just see, you know, how often is this really a thing? And we found some research from Pew uh, Research Center that showed 38% of people who are coming into libraries are coming in to find information on health services. And that's a huge percentage. Um, and I think that it really kind of adjusts our thought process to see what we're doing. And we're definitely seeing that now through COVID and, and how libraries have become a point where people are coming, not necessarily to find, I need help with my health, but how do I get in touch with other resources? Um, and so I thought it'd be really good to also share for people, and, and I'm going to probably lean on Athi a bit here, sorry, um, to just talk a little bit about how the public library um, is, is working with health in their communities and some opportunities that uh, arise through that. Um, yeah, so right now that's actually kind of a big push in the public libraries, and I'm going to share something from um, the National Networks of Libraries of Medicine um which uh has what's called the consumer health information specialization do you, um do you need to share your 
screen, Effie? No, I put it. I put it in the chat. Okay. So it's a link. Um, All right. And that's something folks might want to follow up on um, right now for um, for the NNLM. If you're a public librarian, they actually will um, fund the um, the application fee, which is seventy five dollars. Um, for the consumer health information specialization, um, which is at the link that I posted in the chat just now. Um, if you're not a public librarian, the big push has been the public library, um, which is why that they're offering this funding through um, NNLM and the Medical Library Association. Um, and there's various ways that folks can go about getting this specialization. Uh, you can take um, a diversity of classes or you can take one course that's called Stand Up for Health. Um, and that's actually one of the big partnerships that we've been doing with NNLM. We're in the process, we're waiting for a response to a grant application which was submitted last week, which would support um, having the Stand Up for Health and other courses done as learning circles in the Miami-Dade community. So it's um, something that MDPLS would be doing and we would be inviting others to join us um, in what are called learning circles. And we're hoping to implement this in the fall, um, depending if we get the funding one way and if we don't get the funding is still going to happen and we're still going to extend it to um, the, the all the libraries in the community. It's not going to be just um, MDPLS staff who are invited for this. Uh, we are going to be contacting folks through the training departments at different places. So this um, this consumer health information specialization is so that we can do um, well librarians are expected to be comfortable with a lot of topics and health literacy might not be one of the ones that we have been trained in specifically the consumer health information specialization helps with providing some guidance on how to use the pubmed how to use um, medline plus um, how we can kind of level some of those um, some of those materials so that our uh, patrons get the need get their information needs met. Um, one of the big things with health information is even educated people may not um, you know people you would consider high education or high literacy skills in English. Um, may not understand the directions that come with their their prescriptions, or they might not understand a diagnosis from a doctor. Um, because especially, you know, doctors and nurses, sometimes they speak in a lot of jargon. So this is kind of um, another way that we can help to provide some better health reference services and make folks a little bit more comfortable with the provision of that type of um, reference because it's you know one of those things it's like what they didn't teach us in library school <laughs> you know and we think oh yeah we can do reference but this is kind of a sensitive topic mm -hmm. and um, it has a lot of privacy concerns folks might uh, you know, it, it, it implies a level of trust if they're coming to us for, for health literacy. So the materials in a lot of the um, like Medline and in the PubMed um, databases are written at levels that can accommodate um, folks who may not be reading above a seventh grade level. And they're a little bit more straightforward and they're, they're not like um, going into Google and finding something that's written with an obvious slant. So um, they're good materials, they're vetted. And that's one of the things that we're working on is encouraging folks um, 
to get the consumer health information specialization within the system um, with this grant that we wrote. Um, we were hoping to encourage roughly 20 new uh, participants into the program. Um, and we are gonna um, try to expand it uh, into the community so that other librarians can also participate um, whether they choose to go through the application process or not um, if they're not public librarians supported by an NLM. Um, so the public libraries are also uh, going to have the Westchester uh, Health and Wellness Center installed at the Westchester Regional Library, which used to be West Dade on Coral Way. Um, they changed the name and that was um, its funding from its GOB funding. So we are guaranteed that it will be built. The groundbreaking will happen officially next month and we're expecting it'll be online essentially um, by the middle of 2021. And it's going to be a 3,000 square foot facility that has an auditorium and a health uh, literacy reading room that's going to be manned by librarians in some capacity who will help folks to get um, the information, the health related information. It's going to have an auditorium that um, that will hold roughly 100, 120 people. Hopefully, if we ever get to go back to um, meetings that can actually happen in person. <laughs> um, and the design there is that it would help us to develop some partnerships with um, local health providers to do courses, to do classes, to do um, even like, um, exercise type of things. So if, if there was a Zumba or a yoga, you know, um, those types of things, it would be a facility that augments um, the wellness activities that the library is involved with. Um, Buffy, where is the facility going to be? It's going to be next to West Dade Regional. They changed the name of West Dade to West Chester now. Oh, so okay. It's the, it's the library that's on Coral Way. Um, and they did a, um, a un they did the official groundbreaking with the, the commissioner who did the funding um, and who, whose project this was um, back a few months ago when we still could do activities. But the, um, but the, 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 the equipment to come and dig up the ground is going to start happening probably next month. Um, they they did say that they were they were doing the real groundbreaking next month, and we're hoping to have it online um, by the middle of 2021. Um, the county has a number of health initiatives. Um, if if anybody is interested, you can kind of rummage through the board of county commissioners um, their their resolutions. And so um, health is a focus for the county as well. So for those of us who are county employees, you know, we are, we are expected to, to um, support those activities as best as we can. And this is just a couple of the ways that we've done. So um, I'm hoping to hear back about the grant. So the next, the next Lunch and Learn, hopefully I'll hear more about it and be able to give people a better idea um, for those that are interested in participation and in reaching out to me about how they might join one of the learning circles um, along those lines. Um, we are trying to, um, as, as the, the public library, we are trying to reach out a little bit more um, in the next coming months. Uh, through our training department to support smaller libraries that may not have um, as big um, as big of a uh, department that is focused on the trainings. So like any opportunities we're trying to open up for our staff, we're going to try to 
include either community partners or other libraries as well, um, just to kind of increase that collaborative networking um, throughout the county. I'm curious about something because I think I think everybody uh, um, everybody else here is from MDC, right, or FIU? Am I wrong? Anybody else from public library? I don't remember now, but is 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 Stephanie Garcia Stephanie Garcia from MDPLS or Stephanie Garcia from MDC? MDC. <laughs> <laughs> okay, That's we're taking so, over. Yes. Um, no, the reason why I'm asking is because I, I I have forgotten to ask you, and I'm I'm just curious. Now that you guys are open, you've been open now for what two months or so? Uh, um, month and a half. Just about. Just about. Yeah. Yeah. Um, are you finding that you get a lot of people who would usually be going to an academic library, but because those are closed, are going to you instead? We have, if I took you guys on a tour right now, um, what you would see is every seat where we have limited seating, but you would see every seat is taken up by teachers or students who are college level students who need a place mm. to study. Yeah. If I took you guys out there, if I had it on my phone today, I have Zoom on my computer today. Mm -hmm. I didn't put it, next time I'll log in on the phone so that you guys, I can take you guys on impromptu tours. <laughs> <laughs> Every time you guys get a tour of uh, Kendall Lakes. <laughs> Come visit me. Come visit me. They're it's pretty neat library. tours, I'll say. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I'm lucky because I feel like, um, you know, I kind of feel like my library is a little bit Valhalla. It's like, um, it is, it is, it's the warrior's heaven. <laughs> um, but yeah, we do, we do get a lot of um, students from MDC and from FIU who are, they, they need a quiet place to study or they need access to high speed internet. So our Wi-Fi is actually fairly decent. We did expand our Wi-Fi um, at the beginning of the reopening. We expanded, we had uh, extenders installed at all of our facilities. So it expands it well into our parking areas. We have a number of spots that are marked as um, Wi-Fi extended. So like folks who might- I've seen that on a couple of, uh, from other libraries. I didn't know MDPLS was doing it, but I saw some libraries had parking spots with signs that say you drive up Wi-Fi. Yeah, that's what we've, we've got it at all 50 branches, depending on how close the parking is to the building. Um, and for us, it extends well into the garden. And because we're next to a park, the park also has their Wi-Fi. So essentially there's full coverage for almost a city block surrounding Kendale Lakes. Yeah, that I feel like that's something that we should really be making sure if, if, on the MDC side that our students and FIU probably also that our students are aware that the libraries do have this as a resource because I know a lot of times uh, one of the biggest issues with going back to school is the struggle of how am I gonna manage being online when I have, you know, my brother's in high school and my mom has to take a meeting and all of this stuff and a lot of the wi-fi is being drained even if you have the devices and if well, you don't then using the library to have devices also well i will say too it gives you the opportunity too because folks might not be comfortable coming into the library but they're perfectly mm -hmm. comfortable to sit in their car for 20 minutes if they need to do something, do bill pay, do um, You whatever. need a break from your kids and you just want to drive up and use some internet. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, so I'm going to go now. <laughs> <laughs> the, the funny thing is, I, I'm- I think that is so awesome because, you know, we, <laughs> we have been joking, uh, me and, and Barbara, have probably been in some some of the discussions on this you know i for, for a while there um after the governor vetoed all the funding for flvc <laughs> which basically provided all of our uh, provides all of our funding for not only a lot of databases but also our remote access off campus access we had a couple of different meetings where we were joking about how students were just gonna have to drive up to the parking lot 
and you know the garages and actually connect to our resources while on campus and it is so funny that you guys are doing it and people are actually using it and if you look on our social media it's actually one of the most retweeted um retweeted and reshared content on instagram twitter and facebook like wow. it's it's one of the things that has it really has hit home with people who um with people who who have this need um and currently we are in the process of expanding um a lot of these connectivity things um we're in the process of writing three or four grants right now that are related to um a number of these expanding and bridging the digital divide in different ways um, that are going to be through different partnerships and collaborative efforts um, with business in the community. So it's going to be um, it's going to be something big in the coming months, year. Hopefully, if we're successful with any of these grants, um, one of them would give. LTE uh, laptops. So basically laptops that are connectable through uh, cellular to, to folks to use. Mm -hmm. So that, I mean, that's one of the things like as people are starting to get back into entrepreneurial endeavors, as people are going back to school um, or studying for tests or need to be on a guaranteed internet connection for a test because you think about it how many times have you seen have you seen kids doing something online that is time um time limited like a quiz or a test mm -hmm. and um you know the hours of operation uh cut them short or um you know, the computer session cuts them short and they don't realize it and, and they lose work or, you know, so it's, it's going to be a great thing if it works out the way that we think it's going to work out. Um, so they're, they're tied to health stuff in the sense that we've had to change our reconstitution of services um, to address the public health guidelines. And as such, um, it's it's kind of related to this conversation, but hopefully we'll be successful. And uh, Twitter, uh, did you did you? I found yeah, I found the tweet. <laughs> you found the tweet the the tweet that's been shared a million times. Well, this was a lighter one, but it does show the drive up spots, which I thought was nice. Yeah. I will say also, and something that I think that. I can speak for MDC. I'm I'm assuming a lot of it's true for FIU also. Um, but for MDC, a lot of us are very our opens our li our libraries are open to everybody coming in. So we do a lot of work with our community when it comes to, um, you know, open. Uh, Oh, I just lost the word. Like job applications or job application like or, or like signing up for insurance and things like that. Right. Like all of these community processes. And there's a lot of resources that are out there that are aimed towards public libraries. Um, and when we get the reading list at the end, you'll see that we've shared some of them. But there's a lot of uh, resources that are available for us to help when we don't, because kind of what Athie was saying, these are the things we weren't taught in library school, right? Of how, especially in an academic library, how do I work with uh, community members coming in who are trying to sign up for affordable health care <laughs> and and I don't know those steps so there's a lot of resources that are out regarding that as well Go ahead. So just to support that I'm adding something now Caitlin since you said it um, the Public Library Association has an open resource called digital learn and um, on there they have modules they have little learning modules about how to navigate some health literacy things as well. Um, at this point uh, with Digital Learn, one of the grants that we did write was to get one that was branded with the MDPLS because if we have it branded, we also have access, it's, it's all open source code. And with that, we'll be able to develop our own courses so I'm thinking along the lines of um, staff developing mini classes 
And these lessons are all very brief. I think one of the longest ones is like 18 minutes, but they run anywhere from two minutes to like 20 minutes long. So it's kind of a nugget of information without overwhelming. And it's kind of a nice introduction. Um, so if somebody has a chance to look at digitallearn.org, um, that's one of the public library associations. Um, resources that is open and it's available and and maybe um, you guys that have the health literacy guides want to add that as well for folks who are looking to to join like the ACA great are the Wi-Fi stations in the parking lot um, at all the libraries or just some I think it's all of the libraries. I be, actually, I think according to the, the tweet I found, it's at Coral Gables, Coral Reef, Country Walk, Edison Center, Fair Lawn, Golden Glades, Hylia Gardens, International Mall, and Kendall Lakes. Well, I can speak to that they did expand that. Maybe they okay. didn't add the Twitter. They, that, that, might, that, that tweet might be the original one. It's old um, now. Yeah, but I know other libraries also have it. Um, some of them, like uh, the one in the hammocks, West Kendall Regional, they may not just because their parking spaces are well off from the library. Yeah. Um, but the, there's a good number of them and and as always if somebody has a question i would always just call the library to tell you what exactly is the condition of their 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 spaces you know like yeah and april made a really good point solid wi-fi and lte are synonymous with bread and water especially right now yeah <laughs> they are almost a necessity mm -hmm. well i mean yeah it's and like the, the thing that you were mentioning about the grant with about getting laptops with um, cellular access. I mean, that's as somebody who had to call in because their internet died. <laughs> I mean, that would be that would make my work so much easier if I had that dedicated cellular access on a laptop. Exactly. You know, Alex, so maybe you can be one of our first patrons. Uh, when I'm we there. Just let me know. Give me the inside scoop. I will. I'll let you know. I'll let you know when the closest library gets theirs. I'll be like, hey, Alex, you need to be first in the door that day. <laughs> the other thing that I think that Athe's brought up a good point for is I we talk a lot about grant funding and when we're looking for different grant opportunities, a lot of times we always fall back to um, what K through 12 organizations we're working with or college or universities that the public library is partnering with. But I also think this kind of opens our eyes and opportunities to, to organizations that are outside of that world and are more in the healthcare world. I know that there's a lot of grants, especially in the public library worlds where they're partnering with organizations or hospitals and they're holding um, health-based classes on the library property, which is yeah. kind of interesting and, and yeah. doing a lot more activity-based work. Um, and especially during a time like this, where we're focusing so much on let's get outside, because when we do things outside, if we have a little bit more freedom to, to be around people, I know that that's makes it a little bit easier. So it does open up opportunities with that as well and, and what we can do, whether it be searching for grants or just searching for programming. Right. And that's what I was going to say, um, like for the public libraries, some of our courses and classes are offered um, from like Baptist Health and from Jackson. So like here at Kendall Lakes, our um, baby and me program when that was active was a Baptist Health um, program. And it's, it's just a, it's a very nice collaboration because then it takes some of the pressure and the onus off of us being absolute experts, but it does create that entreaty for the library as a space for health. Right. Especially if we already know statistically, they're already coming for that reason. If we can provide support for that, it would make it a lot smoother for, for people. 
Um, we will, like I, I've stated before, and it's already on, I'm going to share a link here. It's already on our DCLA page. We have a list of resources that are also, is hopefully will um, nicely tie into what we've talked about today and go past it a little bit. Um, talking about, you know, health in libraries. Uh, thank you, Patricia. Yeah, actually that the, the yellow car is my librarian too. <laughs> He's, he's um, my second in command. <laughs> it's a great car model. Yeah, I I love. I I wish my car was an obnoxious color. It's white. <laughs> Well, from here, we have a couple of resources from ALA. We didn't talk about this, but this is a very uh, great point, especially nationally. Libraries are a huge uh, meeting point for the opioid crisis response and, and how we can help with that. Uh, we also have the Help Happens in Libraries, which is the last link listed, is a, uh, I believe this was a grant-funded program that is finished its funding period, but they've left a lot of their resources open and available um, through the Institute of Museum and Library Services. So please, uh, this is available. I put the link in the chat. This is also available in our DCLA website, along with the reading list from our previous weeks. If you want to take a look at some more information on one of the topics we've been discussing over the Lunch and Learn series. And you, you can see all the tabs from all the links, so, so the serious <laughs> ones. Yeah, no, I, 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 I have seven to say. Shared. Yeah, Isabel, that was a great share. Thank you. Um, and then, you know, this, and then there's the, there's the one that I contributed, which is totally like. That, that, that unfortunately is the most important of all the things that we've spoken <laughs> about because, you know, um, it's incredibly salient since we were talking about internet access. And if you have a cat destroying your couch, your internet access is disrupted. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> oh, All right. The other thing I want to share, so um, thank you again, Barbara Sarando, for being here and sharing all of the resources that you've provided. They are phenomenal, and I will be using them often. Um, and thank you to everyone who's participating too. Athi, I know I can always rely on you to provide a great perspective from the public library. So thank you per usual. Um, I do, I want to. No, I was gonna admit, I was gonna say, I don't know, do, do either of you, B or, or Barbara know if, um, what happens if you actually drive up to campus and just park in one of the parking spaces and. You, you get know. excellent Wi-Fi, especially in front right. of the Chick-fil-A. No, I know, but like, are they allowing people to just be in their cars in the parking spaces? I wonder. That's a good question. Because if it, if they are, then you know that you're, you know, as Barbara mentioned a couple of different times, you know, you're get people who are not from FIU can drive up to the parking spaces and use our resources by connecting to our guest and, Wi-Fi. And that might be something nice um, for FIU to market as well as they support the community, you know, because at this point, if most of the classes are going to be um, virtual, then possibly the thing that that um, the libraries could advocate for and to speak to parking services and the folks who are in charge of all of that to not find people for being on the campus like open parking but it creates the it, it creates another node of access in the community and if there was a way that that maybe IT could track the number of guest usership um, you know it gives it gives a statistic for the impact that a public institution has on the community that would be a positive impact as we're trying to go towards a recovery past pandemic that's a great point you know, I mean, it's an advocacy point and it's an impact point, you know, Definitely. as we're all reconstituting services, what is FIU's real support in the community? You know, MDC, the, the, the parking police are a little bit less, 
militant, but at FIU, I've I've been given a ticket two and a half seconds after something. I've been fired. given a ticket, and I have a parking permit. <laughs> I, let me tell you, I don't get you don't get tickets at MDC, but the one thing is you get security that just public public safety just follows you everywhere you go. Because I've driven on the Kettle campus, and they just follow behind you. I'm like, okay, sorry, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. <laughs> So, uh, Caitlin, I did want to say thank you so much for your role emceeing as well as Patricia. Um, I think it's, it's great. Um, I really like the way that our Lunch and Learn series has come together in the sense of like as an interaction and an opportunity to talk to colleagues who we don't get to see, especially for me in the public side. I don't get to see you guys from MDC and I kind of miss the academic side. I'm a year out from being one of you all. <laughs> yeah, you get a foot in both worlds. Yeah, I, well, I, I want to keep my, I want to keep my toe in both worlds. I don't know if I want to, I don't want to get foot. the whole foot, but just the, the pinky toe. <laughs> Well, the next our we this is our third lunch and learn that we've had on our last one, our fourth one for this series is on August nineteenth, and I hope that you will all be able to join us again for it. We will be discussing building communities of critical thinkers, and what that means is really kind of focusing on misinformation, the world of fake news, and how libraries and librarians can work to um, combat that. So we will hopefully have a wonderful discussion then as well. It's going to be same time, same place just on August 19th, so in two weeks. Um, oh, and we will be announcing the new DCLA board. I'm getting a note now. Um, let me double check if I'm missing anything else. I think that's about it. Um, please tell your friends <laughs> to come join us on our last session. I really hope that you guys have been enjoying this and I think it'll be a great resource for everybody. Um, and hopefully something we, we continue in the future. Um, I we're also hope, I think looking at getting maybe a survey together to get out. I'm thinking it might be best to do at the end of our next session. So if you've been a part of this series, we'll kind of survey on how you thought this went and what we can do something more like this in the future to, to meet your needs um, for you and your library. Um, but that's about it, I think. Thank you all so, so very much for being here. Appreciate you all. Thank you. And thank you, Caitlin, for moderating. Here to support. Have a great day, everyone. We'll see you on August 19th. Bye, everybody. Bye. Stay safe. Stay you safe. Too. Be well.